In the middle of this ongoing crisis, the question of who to trust, how to find truth, free speech and censorship are taking centre stage. To explore these issues, I thought the best person to speak to would be Douglas Murray, the associate editor of The Spectator magazine and the author of the bestsellers, The Strange Death of Europe and The Recent Madness of Crowds. So we discussed the censorship of the big tech platforms. These people have got unbelievable power and, uh, and, and they're not worthy of it. I haven't thought seriously about any issues, certainly not about this one, certainly not about censorship, certainly not about free speech, certainly not about how you hold the keys to the world's thinking. The decline of the traditional media. One thing I don't think has got enough attention in recent years is the extent to which no public discussion is genuinely taking us forward on main platforms. I'm genuinely worried about this, that no discussion show on the BBC or anywhere else actually solves anything. It doesn't even get close. And what's the reason for that? The reason is that that's not the aim anymore. The aim is to have a piece of theatre and we also talked about the issues raised by the recent Rebel Wisdom investigation into David Icke and London Real. I saw your video on uh, Brian Rose and uh, London Real. Mm. And I was glad you picked up on that. That was a fascinating corner in all of this. Douglas, thank you for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, so we've, we've spoken before a couple of times on the channel. And we haven't talked about your latest book, Madness of Crowds. We talked about uh, Strange Death of Europe and Madness of Crowds is really, really interesting. In it, you kind of look at the way the media portrays certain uh, perspectives. Do you want to give us a very quick pressy of what Madness of Crowds is about before we go into a little bit of the detail? Sure. Uh, the Madness of Crowds came out late last year. It's coming out in paperback in September. Uh, and it's about what I regard as being all the crowd madnesses of our time, the identity issues that have roiled through our societies. Um, um, of course, since it came out, uh, uh, we've had different types of madness descend in our societies. And so in a way, the interesting thing in this moment to me is, um, you know, w what is holding up in that and, and what seems already to be positively historical, you know. And, um, and that's because, you know, I, 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 was, I was saying as I was writing it, and I say in the book, I mean, these things of group identities based on race, uh, gender, sexuality, and, and, and so on are, are shallow identities, uh, which are themselves the products of, of a vacuum, which I described in my previous book. Um, but I always thought that the discussions on privilege and microaggressions and all of this stuff that we were forced to hear about on a daily basis was the product of a society that was rich and comfortable and didn't have enough to moan about. Because you can only moan about microaggressions if you live in a society where there's very little aggression. I've heard a few people say that the virus has killed woke. Is that, yeah, what I, do you make I, of that? I'm very wary of simply using the virus as a justification for your pre-existing hopes. And I think an awful lot of people have done that. You know, there have been people who said, well, this is the um, end of this or the beginning of that, the triumph of this. And, and it, always, um, it always completely accords with their pre-existing views. And so I'm just wary of that. It did occur to me, I'm not immune to that myself, it did occur to me at the beginning of this virus, well, perhaps we'll hear a little less from the woke crowd. I, I can't deny that I, I, I expect that wider society might have a little less time for it now. But, but that might just be me imposing a hope on this. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, the recession that we're already in is a time when an awful lot of families in countries like ours are going to be suffering and seeing a fall off in their lifestyles and you know considerable unemployment and all of the problems that come from that and i just i think i think it's unlikely that in that era we're going to spend as much time talking about what sam smith wants to be called today but but that won't mean that people like that don't keep doing that yeah, I mean, there's one, there's one topic that I've really wanted to talk to you about since I read Madness of Crowds, 
And that's subtle differences that I'm picking up between the UK and the US attitude to a lot of these topics. And because I get the sense that there is quite subtle but quite important differentiations of the policing of these kind of arguments in the UK and the US. Mm. I'm going to use the, the trans example uh, because I think there's a very illustrative example here with um, the Guardian UK edition brought out a very kind of vanilla leader article that said, we've got to understand that there are differing um, factors at play. There are trade-offs, for example, around uh, gender identity and also same-sex attraction um, that, that what has historically been the the defense of, of gay rights is threatened by the, the rejection of gender identity of trans, et cetera. Just, just laying out that there are different factors at play. And that was rejected wholesale by the Guardian's US staff as being transphobic. And I get, I get this sense that both in the UK and the US, this is a hugely polarizing and a hugely activating debate. But there seems to be more of a healthy debate in my view in the UK maybe because of our history of kind of radical feminism in the Labour Party, mm. that there's a slightly different background. I'm picking up subtle differences that in the US, if you deviate from a certain kind of fixed ideology, you're, you're put beyond the pale. It's not just beyond the pale. It's, it's, you get put on a particular political side. That's what's important, is that, I mean, obviously, the, the ideal is that we don't have identity issues. We don't have actual rights issues fought through the prism of a different political issue. So the ideal would be that, 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 that what, what legitimate claims there are within the trans issue do not have to be translated through the prism of whether or not you're pro or anti-Donald Trump. It's a very bad way to, to discuss that. If, if you actually want to discuss the fascinating issue, which, which uh, I'm surprised The Guardian dared to venture into, um, of aut autogynephilia, of whether or not trans is to do with sexual attraction and sexual kick or not, very, very interesting issue, very dangerous issue, um, then, then you would hope that you could have that very important and finely balanced discussion without having to use Donald Trump as the dividing line. I mean, after all, why would you? Um, and the answer is just that, that America is stuck in the same position that Britain was stuck in until, I'd say, December the 12th last year, where, it, where everything in Britain was seen through the Brexit prism and everything became a culture war to do with Brexit. You know, America can't even have the coronavirus without having the debate through the prism of Donald Trump and whether it's going to be helpful for his re-election or, or, or not. And that's, that's why you, ju you just can't have a discussion. It was bad enough in America already because they had this endless thing of whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. And, you know, there's a growing number of people, quite rightly, in the US who realise that, that is a really not helpful prism on a lot of issues. Not all issues, but on a lot of issues. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about this because obviously America is the most important country in the world. It's, it's cultural um, impact for good and ill is global in a way that no other countries is. So, and, and, and I do think that a lot of the problems that we've seen on the identity questions in recent years have to a great extent come about because we have imported parts of the American debate. You know, we've imported parts of the American race debate to the UK in a way which I think has been massively uh, deleterious for the UK. Um, and, and, you know, so it, it matters when, when the major democracy in the world has a debate this bad and public thinking so poor. Yeah, you're already going into the, the area that I was hoping to go into next. And I do, I get this sense that the, the pandemic, certainly the... The, the fault lines it's exposing in America and the way that it seems to be kind of accelerating almost like a catalyst of the already existing culture war seems existential to me almost in a way that, mm -hmm. that it doesn't in the UK. And you, you had an interview recently with Joe, uh, where I think politics, Joe, I think it was, mm -hmm. where you pointed out how the UK and the US are reacting very differently to this. And I think it's really interesting to drill down into why that might be. 
because there was also this sense for a long time, you pointed out that the, the UK had very similar fault lines. We didn't trust our experts. We, we didn't trust the media, all of these same fault lines. But actually, since the pandemic has struck, there's been this sense of kind of some kind of, I don't know, sobering up in a way in the UK that yeah. hasn't happened in the US. I agree. I mean, I think that I think that Boris Johnson has been able to call on goodwill that we didn't know was there until recently, or we'd forgotten was there. Um, I think that is partly to do with him, partly to do with his, his history. I, I, I think that if the Conservative Party at this stage had been led by a highly authoritarian right-wing figure who looked like he really wanted to lock the British people in our homes, I think we wouldn't have agreed with such alacrity. And um, this, this, of all of the detractors, all the criticism he comes in for, I do think that is worth remembering. Um, I, I think that Britain is in a healthy-ish position on that. We're not in a healthy position economically, but no one is. Um, but but we, we have trusted the experts. By the way, there is a huge caveat coming there, isn't there? Which I'm sure you can feel as I can feel, which is what if what if the experts are shown to have got this very significantly wrong or um, have have got the their predictions way out. I'm starting to think that that is the case. Perhaps I'm slow to the party on that, but I think most of us are starting to notice that, that the virus is clearly worse than some people have been pretending and not as bad as we first feared. Um, uh, and if it does turn out that the that the scientists got it wrong at the beginning, I worry that <laughs> what trust we have just refound in expertise is about to be lost in a way that that it hasn't been since I don't know our loss of trust in the intelligence community after the w- WMD issue in two thousand and three. So that uh, that does worry me. But but yes, broadly speaking, we are in a better place than America where where people don't, don't, half the country doesn't trust the president at all. And, and I think certainly in some sections uh, uh, would be happy for the economy to crash as long as it crashes on Donald Trump's watch and therefore he doesn't get reelected. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly true that Trump is a factor, like Trump, Trump sort of derangement syndrome, as people have talked about, mm. I think exists on both sides, like pro sure. and anti. Yeah, um, but but I wonder if there's other factors as well. This sense of this sort of I, I get the sense of a civic space in the UK that's just outside of the dynamics of polarisation, and there's mm-hmm. all sorts of reasons for that. I think that I wonder whether the BBC has something to do with that. That mm-hmm. there is at least some some centre of power that is not being pulled one side or the other by corporate factors and by the sort of polarisation mm-hmm. spiral. What do you what what else do you think might be behind these two different reactions. I, I think it's that I think I think I have to say this is a, this is a point I've made a few times in recent weeks and and it's 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 in some ways a very obvious one which is just that we, we do have some institutions that are above politics the clearest and most obvious of which is the monarchy and for all the criticisms that are leveled by the republicans in the UK I, I think they've had a hell of a virus you know um the Queen was about the only figure we really wanted to give her take um, in the early weeks. And I do think that you know, as a small C conservative, um, I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that because conservatism, in the way I understand it, has an awful lot to do with institutions. And that's, that's built on the idea that institutions reflect the public and, and, and that they are they are reflexive things that, that the public gives trust to the institution and the institution gives trust to the public and that they're complementary. And of course it means that people are loyal to institutions that are loyal to them. Uh, but these bonds are incredibly important and they, 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 they aren't built up overnight. You know, the bond that does, does exist for all the criticisms I and many others level at them with the BBC, th- there is a level of trust that means that when something, a pandemic, something like that occurs, 
you know, we we do turn on the BBC that for something like the VE Day celebrations last week. The BBC does the job, you know, and and and, and that's that's very important. But you know, the, the central insight of conservatism on this is, of course, is that such trust takes an awfully long time to build and that important and significant meaningful institutions take a very long time to build with the rider that of course they can be destroyed very easily i mean it would be it, it, it would be extremely easy to deracinate the public space but at times like this you would recognize i hope some of the consequences had that have happened you know if if the if the, if the united kingdom had to wait on the the first speech by President Kinnock about the virus, where he could reflect on his lessons from 1980s Labour Party politics or something. I don't think the country would be in remotely as healthy a condition as it is. And I think you can do that on a whole range of institutions. I, but I don't want to sound glib about it. But or, or you know, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's rosy. <clears throat> Now, it's interesting you bring up the idea of institutions, because the other thing that I'm really interested to talk to you about is the sort of the influence of the tech platforms, because what we, are, mm. what we have been seeing in, in the media is this huge kind of washing away of a lot of institutional memory and a lot of institutional standards. We've got, we have this whole thing about the tech platforms suddenly making the, the, the realization that they are actually publishers or they have to take on some yes. responsibility as publishers. And... I speak as someone who's been part of uh, Channel 4, been part of the BBC, and then kind of gone outside and made my own films and really enjoyed the freedom to, to, to look at narratives that are often excluded by the mainstream and, and realise the value of that perspective, but also being sort of terrified by the spread of misinformation, mm. the kind of... It, it feels like a very dangerous... I, I've kind of called it an interregnum. We've had this sort of... We were in this institutional framework that has now been kind of washed away and we don't yet yes. have, I could imagine a kind of more decentralized way of finding truth of sort of like, I don't know, yeah. some kind of, but we're not there. We sort of seem to be in a very dangerous place while we're in this interregnum and there's no real gatekeepers and there's no real way of asserting what's true anymore. It, 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 it actually does have a significant similarity with the issue that I, I brought up earlier about the Brexit and Trump issue, you know, my sadness about both of these issues in recent years has been the opportunity cost of the opponents of these realities, avoiding the opportunity to learn from something. One of the major things is they lost the opportunity to recognize that the American public voted for Donald Trump, despite everything that they knew about him in 2016. It's the same thing with the Brexit thing. You know, I happen to be in favor of Brexit, like the majority of the British public. But I, I just I, I, I think it was a massive mistake of people who voted the other way to have lost to have missed the opportunity for years to recognize that they had missed something. They'd got something wrong. They'd massively misread something. And maybe the population were onto something. And it's the same thing with the media issue you, you just raised. The question is why the mainstream media doesn't learn from what it keeps missing why there's so much that it just can't do. Why doesn't it, why doesn't it listen to that? And I, and, and I know, as I'm sure you do, individuals in all the major channels who know that they've been missing something. And they, they know they've been missing something out. They feel it. And they, they, and they, but at an, at an institutional level, they don't know what to do about that. Um, and, and, and I, and I, I just think that they've 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 missed something, and it's it's not just them. As I say, it's common. It's a common issue of our time. Some kind of inability to ameliorate facts and truths that should have been ameliorated by now. I completely agree, and we've put out quite a lot of pieces around that, like what the mainstream is missing and how critical that is. The the fact that they're missing it and being. Um, com regularly surprised by things they didn't expect is is like an existential problem but i also i'm wondering whether you also have some concerns as i do of the like as i'm seeing kind of conspiracy theories rising misinformation rising 
this sort of on the other side of that kind of that pendulum mm. real concerns as well i saw your video on uh, brian rose and uh, london real mm. and i was glad you picked up on that that was a fascinating corner in all of this um and it speaks very much to the concern you've just expressed yeah i'm, I'm glad you saw that yeah what did you make i, I tried to bring in all of the wider issues, which is my concern is that if if somehow we don't find a way of self-policing, that we're going to get really heavy-handed tech censorship that is not going to be able to like I just don't I just don't trust any of these tech platforms to be able to make editorial decisions no. about but, how well something is being treated and how much editorial value there is in treating something. So they're going to squash what I fear is that they'll squash all alternative narratives when we right. desperately need alternative narratives to reboot a lot of our systems. Well, there, there are two particular ways, I think, into, the, into trying to sort that out. The first is to think that the people currently populating the firms are not up to the task. And the second is they wouldn't be whoever they are. So, but let's take the first one first the massive problem on this with the tech companies in the US and the UK is the fact that they have been in in both countries flooded by partisans of a particular political side. So it's in the wake of the Obama, um, uh, uh, the exit of the Obama regime, uh, the Obama government rather, I should say, <laughs> I didn't mean to say regime. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, no, the the, uh, the uh, Obama government uh, um, when it when the, that administration left power, um, the you know the, so many people from it went straight into Silicon Valley and got very well remunerated jobs uh, there, and that's one of the reasons why you see the particular direction of the of the of the demonetization and all that sort of thing there. And something very similar happened in the UK. I mean, since the Liberal Democrats were, were, were very nearly wiped out, not quite nearly enough for my taste, but, um, and Nick Clegg lost his job and so on, um, and went to Facebook. Uh, um, it's the same thing. Facebook's filled with Liberal Democrats. Um, these people are not up to the task. They're, they're, they're all, a very significant number of them, if not all of them, are very low grade, I haven't thought seriously about any issues, N- certainly not about this one, certainly not about censorship, certainly not about free speech, certainly not about how you hold the keys to the world's thinking and wh- whether or how you tread through that era. They haven't thought about any of that, but they have a few existing, pre-existing political views. And you, and unfortunately, the way both in the US and the UK that that expresses itself is the fact that they have this weird idea that there is sort of, you know, you can tackle extremism, for instance, as a thing, rather than particular manifestations of it that are particularly close to the boat. Uh, it seeks to deal with hate. You know, I mean, I mean, how how much of a combination of Big Brother and Kindergarten can you put up with? We're going to deal with hate. Oh yeah, what human emotion are you going to deal with next week? Do you want to take Do you want to take lustfulness? Hmm? Well, how about Let's do gluttony next month. How about envy, pride, pride? Let's go through them all. Yeah, we the tech platforms are going to have a war on pride. I hate. I mean, really. And from that, once you've decided that your self-appointed task is to tackle hate, well, it means among other things you'll take out some things that are true, and and you'll you'll go for. I mean, the problem on this, I'm sure it's personal for me as it is for you. The problem on all of this is we've repeatedly seen how close to our own boats these people are willing to come. You know, not to me, uh, not to you, but to people we think should be in the discussion, sometimes people we know or have spoken with, who, you know, you discover are viewed by YouTube or something as totally reprehensible characters on a par with some kind of Nazi. You know, I, I, I mean, this is obviously part of a wider language and political slippage. 
you know, in our own lifetimes, far right has come to be a term which instead of being used very specifically and necessarily on occasion, has become just something you can call anyone if you don't like them much, want to do them a bit of harm. You know, and 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 these people have got unbelievable power, and uh, and and they're not worthy of it. But that comes to the second point, which is, is it possible for anyone to do that? Even if Eric and uh, um, a load of other brilliant people were in charge of it, could they do it? Could could you do it? Could I do it? I don't know. I mean, I I think to a great extent this is the problem of of this this second bit. Who who? Who on earth would you give the right to police the internet to? You know, who's your candidate? Do you, do you think, I mean, this is the other issue is that, especially on YouTube, um, there's such a kind of free speech absolutism. So people kind of deny the need for any policing whatsoever, um, which to me seems naive, um, especially when you come, I think a good example recently is like, okay, we're dealing with something like medical cures, we, we have mm. regulations around kind of miracle cures, for example, because we know yes. if someone claims to be able to cure cancer, someone is going to be desperate enough to go to them. Like, I, I'm interested as well. Are you a free speech absolutist? Or if not, what is... It, this feels like an impossible algorithm to me. So, so the problem is, is, is that it shifts. Uh, the, the obvious limit on freedom of speech, the only one I agree with, is in incitement. But incitement has to have an incredibly specific um, uh, definition. And it does, by the way, in law. I mean, it's not impossible, this. The incitement laws in a country like Britain are, pr- are pretty good. I mean, you can't, you can't go to prison or be prosecuted for saying, I think X person should die. It might be an unwise use of words, an unkind use of words. But that's not the same thing as standing with a mob outside the person's house and saying to the mob, go get them. That's incitement. That's incitement. And, and the law recognizes that. It's not, it's not impossible. We're not starting from year zero in any of this. It's contrary, again, to the expectations of a lot of people who seem to go and work at YouTube and Google. Um, and so, so that is where I draw the line. I think that the very interesting one on cures, which you raise is, is tricky because it comes close to that. Doesn't it? Um, I, I have to say, I can't deny I have a certain free song of enjoyment when I see total hucksters behaving as they have throughout history in our own time. I just, as a historian, I find it fascinating and you know at the very beginning of this corona crisis there was the that there's a guy uh, or the um uh, uh what's his name he used to be married to tammy Faye, and he was a a huckster preacher in the u.s and he went to prison in the 90s you know uh, for the usual reasons and uh, and you know, televangelist and and you know no one had heard from him for a couple of decades and now but the corona crisis comes along back he pops onto some uh, network in America claiming that his files of, um, of, of something with silver in them are the only cure for Corona. And I just, I look at this with a, I can't deny, a certain sort of joy that such a, a figure as Chaucer wrote about should be existing throughout human history. Always, always those people are there. Always they're with us. And there is something... Um, so, so there is something ineradicable about it, which is and one of the most important things, I think, in, in finding sense and our place in the universe is always to try to reconcile with ourselves with the things we can do nothing about and to recognise them, to recognise there will always be hucksters and frauds and chancers and fakers. And we can't eradicate that we cannot give them platforms, definitely. We can try to expose them, for sure. Um, but we can't eradicate it. Those people, and, and those people are going to take in some people. Is it impossible that they, well, they wouldn't at some stage? And so, so when I, but the one that obviously, which you, you talked about and which, which is very uh, alarming is this, this one, this one of the Ike, uh, uh, thing because you know I, I 
I said this to somebody the other day when they brought this su- subject up, but when I was interviewed by um, that the, the man from London Real, who I liked and um, had an interesting interview, um, uh, he mentioned David Icke to me. He said, oh, that's interesting. I just think David Icke, you know, David Icke said to me recently, and I sort of, you know, what? what? You know, I, I, and I just thought, well, I've never been to the station. I've never seen it. But I, I thought, what, what are you doing interviewing David Icke? I mean, I, yeah, I have no interest in the man. Uh, um who I last saw, I think, on Wogan, wasn't it? Uh, declaring himself to be Jesus or something. I, I, I don't keep a very close eye on people once they've declared themselves to be Jesus. I, I sort of, I turn away. Um, and so, so somebody's citing some of that now. But again, it, it, it's to do with a, it's to do not just with the issue of platforms. It's to do with societal health. And the problem is that at some level we periods like this show up how healthy or not our thought is. And I think it's done pretty well. I think that by and large British society and other, that we don't actually go to David Icke for Corona advice, but there is this issue of what if at a, at a moment equivalent to the person standing outside the person's house saying, go get them at a moment of real, uh, international and, 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 and national crisis, somebody is flogging an idea like, you know, the one that Ike was about 5G masts and so on. And and what if that does lead to people laying those cables being attacked and things being burnt down? Those are things we see throughout history and they happen all the time during epidemics and periods where people are frightened. And I think I, I've got faith that they can be countered. I don't think we need anything wildly authoritarian about that. I just, I genuinely don't think that if David Icke is put into a discussion with somebody who knows what they're talking about, that he can win. I, I, I think there's no chance of it. I think it's a, it's a sign of slight ill health that somebody with his track record could in any way catch on at a time like this. I agree. And I kind of veer between. So there's also it's not just Ike. There's also various other people that are saying um, that are saying things that are getting more like fringe medical figures, for example, who are getting a lot more prominent, saying certain things about the virus being a hoax or. Um, right. And my my concern about that, if I from, from this side, my concern is that they seem to be within. Um, kind of self-enclosed ecosystems with no accountability. Sure, it's this of sort of dynamic of the fact that we used to have a system where with fewer media channels, the, the accountability worked because you had um, a certain number of media channels, you had a certain number of uh, voices, they would be held to account. Now it seems mm. that it's possible for these completely self-enclosed bubbles to exist where no one has to face a uh, contrary position, no one has to face a, a tough interviewer, And I worry that that dynamic just seems to be accelerating, that we've lost any kind of of systematic accountability. I think that's my concern. But I don't, but I veer between thinking that's a real, a huge problem and between thinking, well, actually, it's it's not going to influence that many people. And I I I think you're you're right to be concerned about it. And I think there are times when that concern feels more alive than at others. And I think a few weeks ago, you know, and actually in certain places now with people trying to, you know, breaking lockdowns and all that sort of thing, you can feel population being becoming restive. We can all feel that, restless rather. We can all feel that. And um, I, I've no doubt that there will be some movements and individuals who take advantage of that. Um, and there will be misinformation and disinformation passed around I, I'm not as worried about it at the moment. As I say, I'm, I'm, I am worried if there is a massive reputational hit taken by experts deservedly, because that's when people go elsewhere. But I, a lot of this also is people in, ha, having fun. I think it's, I think it's a, an easily passed over element of it, that people are attracted to slightly dangerous things. You know, I once said to... I once said to Clive James, we were talking about poetry, and I remember saying to Clive, uh, "Oh, you know, you know, how how would you get more young people falling in love with poetry like you did as a young boy growing up in 
Australia in the 1940s, he said, ban the stuff, make it illegal, impose long prison sentences if you're caught with, with it. And you know the truth in that, that uh, of course, you tell, some, tell people that something is dangerous or has been banned and you send people to it. Why? Not because they're all going to believe it, uh, but because uh, uh, some of them might, but a large number are just going there for the kicks and for the curiosity, you know. And, and, and again, we've had that, that discussion with the banning of books for not just decades, we've had it for centuries. We have been through all of this argument before. And, uh, and I reiterate, I'm, I'm concerned by the fact that people, are, people aren't drawing on knowledge that we already have. You know, I, I, I think that John Stuart Mill and Milton are, are useful guides on this. I, I don't see why we've got to learn it all again. This kind of Silicon Valley exceptionalism as well, the sort of sense that these are problems no one's ever dealt with before. That's right. That's because so many of the people working there are kids and, and have no knowledge of history and think that they're in some unique place. And no, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you watched the, the London Real piece because for me, there's just so many issues that it brings up. What I have, what I have been quite... Um, pleased about is I'm seeing so I put out my pieces I think one other one other YouTube channel kind of picked up on it has been doing sort of regular updates as well but what I've seen in the last day or two especially is a real turning of his audience against sort of or at least a questioning in the comments and it it seems that that kind of immune About response seems to be working made. yeah well made a million allegedly made a million bucks we don't know it was on his website but then he he's just started another crowdfunder for another 250 per month to keep it running um and that seems to have kind of uh, sent him over the edge with his own audience so it, so what i'm seeing now i think is this sort of immune response or at least this accountability starting to kick in a bit more yes i and i think that's i think that's perfectly healthy it, it's happened before it'll happen again there'll be lots of people who try to to use, uh, you know, the opportunity to do a sort of bank raid, um, and 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 I think their their readers, their consumers, their followers will resent it just as much as when that has happened with older media. I don't, I, I don't see it in any way being that new. Hmm. Are there any other issues that came up from that piece that that you thought were? Well, I think I, th I think I think that 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 central thing you're over uh, you're over in it, which is how we agree on how we can agree on what is true in the current era is is the is one of the central is one of the central issues, and this is a problem which you've seen and I've seen firsthand with the mainstream media, which is to do with the issue of balance. The massive risk that goes on at the moment is that everything that is known to be true is also known to have a counterbalance and that the counterbalance is given equal weight. And this is, this is a, a great concern. Uh, it's a great concern in the scientific community. It's a great concern as far as I know in every thinking community. And the internet definitely makes that tough because of the enormous ease with which people can access things I, I i let me give you one one example in an area i know a fair amount about uh there are people on the american right very reprehensible figures loathsome figures who have been playing with claims that for instance you know to talk about the holocaust and to question it is to bring incredible risk and danger to yourself um, I reckon that those people are going to have a little bit of a run with some people, particularly very ignorant people and very young people, who have been told about the Holocaust and then go online and see some things that tell them there's another story. And then they are trying to weigh this up. And they seriously think that there is a counter-argument, you know, and... If that can happen with something that is one of the most provable 
things in history, then you can bet it's the case with things that are much less common knowledge. And 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 that is that is a that is a massive issue. And again, how do you divorce that from the people who are going for the lols, you know? Um, sick as that is. Because there will there is obviously in a lot of the reprehensible stuff that happens online, there is a significant amount of that. Yeah, I think I think we probably both have a similar sense of, I mean, some people call it the sense-making crisis. I, I quite like that word. Like what is true seems to be, I don't know if you'd agree, but to me at least feels like the, if there's a generator function of many of the other problems that we're seeing cascading through society, that one seems to be at the core. But I remember something you said in our first interview, which I think was a really great way of summing it up. It's like, we cannot imagine, not only can we not imagine kind of um, a way of addressing these truth claims, we can't even conceive of who that might be. Like yes. who, who, who could possibly have that authority to make those judgments, which, I mean, I, 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 don't see, I don't see a way out. I don't see an obvious way out of this kind of spiral. We all have to concentrate on doing it as well as we can and as hygienically as we can in the areas we know most about. I mean, that's, 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 that's where you start. Uh, and by the way, another one, which I try to practice myself, but is, is not to enter the speculation in an area if you don't know. Um, just keep out of it. Mm. Uh, don't, you know, not everyone has to say everything out loud all the time. Um, there's a, a rule of thumb that's not popular, of course. It, it, it does an awful lot of good if you admit the nature of a conundrum out loud. Um, one thing I don't think has got enough attention in recent years is the extent to which no public discussion is genuinely taking us forward on main platforms. I'm genuinely worried about this, that no discussion show on the BBC or anywhere else actually solves anything. It doesn't even get close. And what's the reason for that? The reason is that that's not the aim anymore. The aim is to have a piece of theater. The aim is to claim you've held politicians to account. The aim is to throw up some, some heat and and everybody who goes on goes on with a specific agenda, which generally is not to do with trying to get things moving forward. So with the COVID issue, you just know that the different politicians have been waiting until they can make political capital in one direction or another. And you know all of the commentators and all of the content providers who have just been using it to shore up something they already had to sell. And my point is, on a whole range of issues, what if we approached it differently? Like, what if, I, I, I hate to cite The Guardian, but you did, and I'm amazed that they did something so comparatively praiseworthy. But let's say that instead of having the vicious, vicious, nasty fight about trans, which is predicated on either, you know, n clap along to trans child getting hormone blockers, or you're killing trans people or making trans people get murdered or making trans people kill themselves. How about we had the discussion on, yeah, actually there are, there are competing virtues and competing claims and they don't all rub along well they rub against each other quite nastily and aggressively in places and we need to work out a way through this to concede that is isn't nothing to go on to almost any other issue um i i did this in the strange death of europe on the migration issue i said as as aristotle shows us if, if you've got two apparent virtues and they're in competition you should recognize it and you should work out which is being misapplied or misunderstood i said it on the migration issue i said it repeatedly that that's a chat that's a a contest between between mercy and and that is mercy to people coming in and justice 
not least justice for the people in the countries they're coming into. Well, a competition between justice and mercy is worth acknowledging and worth drilling down on, just like on a much less important level. It's worth drilling down on the extent to which trans treads over women and treads on to gay people. But where is a discussion, apart from on a few internet sites, a few forums and a few people who write about this stuff, where is the discussion on that? Why do we keep being derailed on it? Why do we keep being distracted? Why do we never get forward on these things? Why don't we solve anything? And, and I, I'm just stunned by the fact that on issue after issue, on the ones I know about, that's what I recognize. And then I speak to people in different disciplines and I discover they have exactly the same um, experience. What's really interesting, I mean, this covers, it's sort of like the generator function seems to be kind of um, a zero sum game in some ways that everyone is involved in this kind of zero sum game. And we, we've kind of talked about it a little bit. A friend of mine, Peter Lindbergh, came up with the idea of an anti-debate, which is instead of this sort of zero sum, who's trying to win is like, can you have a debate where you're trying to build on each other's propositions or because there does seem to be a bug in the source code of what the information economy or the media or something that is, that is constantly cascading us down to the lowest common denominator. It, it has an awful lot to do with the fact that um, no good faith um, is attributed to opponents. And I don't, I don't know how we get out of that because we're all guilty of it. I, I've probably done it myself with the guardian today as on many other occasions. I, it, it, it it's very hard to, I mean, to, to sort of steel man, as it were, what some of my critics and critics of others um, are doing, um, just on the ones I write about. I, I think to steel man their argument and to be kind to them in their analysis, they think that people like me should not write or speak about the things we do because they genuinely think that it is somewhere too close to there for somewhere down the line people doing something terrible because of it and they they believe that if if certain arguments are opened up and allowed to go on we will get to for instance fascism quite fast um and, and in a way i understand the fear because we all have it with political opponents to some extent. Um, I'm no fan of Jeremy Corbyn. And I think that if Jeremy Corbyn had been prime minister elected last December and had asked me, particularly me in my own case, to stay in my house for the foreseeable future, I would have had a hard time trusting him on that because I'd have been wondering what it was he wanted to do down the line and what other liberties he would take away, and so on. So we all have those fears of opponents. It's just that I think something about the, 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 the information technology age has meant that we're always closer to that than we used to be. You know, there are really terrible, reprehensible figures from the right and the left that I've seen across our continent who worry me enormously, but not disproportionately unless I think they're coming close to something like power. And, 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 and so you have to, and I try to keep it in some kind of context. But maybe all of the time, what is happening is that we are attributing to other people a proximity to the worst things all the time and that that makes it impossible to ever act in a spirit of generosity towards people with whom you differ politically. Uh, and, you know, so I say we, I'm guilty, but we're all guilty of it to some extent, but it does make it almost impossible because you have to be able to attribute good motive at some point, not least to people when they know more than you about a subject. You know, that's an absolutely key one. You, you save a lot of time, among other things. Um, but, but for various reasons, we, we have become almost incapable of doing that, of practicing that. And, and somehow we've got to learn 
to acquire that, at least in some circumstances, because we don't have the time. I mean, we just, no individual has the time to work out everything for themselves. You know, we can work out as much as we can for ourselves. We can't work out everything. And we have to have some type of trust in our societies and in individuals and in institutions and in experts, which is why they say, I mean, this is, this is an important moment because what we have been going through in recent weeks may well just be the prelude to something and something much more confusing where we will need good sense-making equipment and we'll need some amount of trust, even more than we've needed it in the weeks leading up to now. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. I'm going to use this for a very clumsy segue to, to mention like all of that that you just opened up is really, really interesting. Like we've been kind of drilling down into that, like the psychological dimension, why, why certain parts of our system are activated by these kind of arguments. I, I don't think there's a way of getting through it without at least understanding kind of some of our basic kind of wiring evolutionary wiring to see to see kind of threats for example um and understanding that sense making is gonna like real sense making is going to involve some kind of trust and it's going to involve some kind of vulnerability or at least a safe space being created for the discussions well uh, and, but also um th- that thing i mentioned earlier the absolutely crucial element of making one's peace with the world to some extent and the world as it is you know, I mean, accepting that there will be, I mean, it's easier to do this, by the way, on an individual level and a historical level than it is to do it on um, a sort of species level. Um, because I think there's a disjunct. I mean, maybe this is a subject for another time. There's a disjunct between explaining p- to people themselves on those terms and the manner in which we feel ourselves to be Uh, and what i mean by that is if you say to people look we are we are hardwired to follow this sort of behavior it, it, it 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 is it can be both true and inadequate to explain ourselves in the manner which we experience ourselves in the world as living so we might, for instance, think, well, I know that's the case with other people, but it's not the case with me. And, and there's something in that, that, that disjunct that I think is interesting. A friend of mine, who was a prison doctor for many years, made the very interesting observation some years ago that he spoke to prisoner after prisoner who said that they had fallen into the wrong crowd. And although he met so many people who'd fallen into the wrong crowd, he never met the crowd. And... <clears throat> And just as people don't say, I was the crowd that other people fell into. So when you explain the way in which we behave on on a kind of genetic level, there's a, there's a, there's, there's something that is, is missed, which is why, as I say, I, I'm much more fond of, explaining it in a way in historical terms or saying that these are the things that have always been with us. Um, and, and then to an extent making your peace with that doesn't mean you don't do anything about it, but it means you have a reasonable, a reasonable approach to things that you can't do anything about. You know, you'll never, you'll never get rid of the hucksters completely. You'll never get rid of the liars and you'll never get the world without hate you know so have have reasonable aspirations it seems to me great a very good place to end on douglas thank you very much for joining me no it's a great pleasure good to be with you again rebel wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media it was built for these times of crisis and change which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times more films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.